The reason the lion did not have to do as the witch wished was that every night, while the woman was asleep, Dorothy carried him food from the cupboard. After he had eaten, he would lie down on his bed of straw, and Dorothy would lie beside him and put her head on his soft, shaggy mane while they talked of their troubles and tried to plan some way to escape. But they could find no way to get out of the castle, for it was constantly guarded by the yellow winkies, who were the slaves of the wicked witch and too afraid of her not to do as she told them. The girl had to work hard during the day, and often the witch threatened to beat her with the same old umbrella she always carried in her hand. But, in truth, she did not dare to strike Dorothy because of the mark upon her forehead. The child did not know this and was full of fear for herself and Toto. Once, the witch struck Toto a blow with her umbrella, and the brave little dog flew at her and bit her leg in return. The witch did not bleed where she was bitten, for she was so wicked that blood in her had dried up many years before. Dorothy's life became very sad as she grew to understand that it would be harder than ever to get back to Kansas and Aunt Em again. Sometimes she would cry bitterly for hours, with Toto sitting at her feet and looking into her face, whining dismally to show how sorry he was for his little mistress. Toto did not really care whether he was in Kansas or the land of Oz, so long as Dorothy was with him. But he knew the little girl was unhappy, and that made him unhappy too. Now the wicked witch had a great longing to have for her own the silver shoes which the girl always wore. Her bees and her crows and her wolves were lying in heaps and drying up, and she had used up all the power of the golden cap. But if she could only get hold of the silver shoes, they would give her more power than all the other things she had lost. She watched Dorothy carefully to see if she ever took off her shoes, thinking she might steal them. But the child was so proud of her pretty shoes that she never took them off except at night and when she took her bath. The witch was too much afraid of the dark to dare to go into Dorothy's room at night to take the shoes, and her dread of water was greater than her fear of the dark, so she never came near when Dorothy was bathing. Indeed, the old witch never touched water, nor ever let water touch her in any way. But the wicked creature was very cunning, and she finally thought of a trick that would give her what she wanted. She placed a bar of iron in the middle of the kitchen floor, and then by her magic arts made the iron invisible to the human eyes, so that when Dorothy walked across the floor she stumbled over the bar, not being able to see it, and fell at full length. She was not much hurt, but in her fall, one of the silver shoes came off, and before she could reach it, the witch had snatched it away and put it on her own skinny foot. The wicked woman was greatly pleased with the success of her trick, for as long as she had one of the shoes, she owned half the power of the charm, and Dorothy could not use it against her, even had she known how to do so. The little girl, seeing she had lost one of her pretty shoes, grew angry and said to the witch, "'Give me back my shoe!' I will not, retorted the witch, for it is now my shoe and not yours. You are a wicked creature, cried Dorothy. You have no right to take my shoe from me. I shall keep it just the same, said the witch, laughing at her, and some day I shall get the other one from you too. This made Dorothy so very angry that she picked up the bucket of water that stood near and dashed it over the witch, wetting her from head to foot. Instantly, the wicked woman gave out a loud cry of fear, and then as Dorothy looked at her in wonder, the witch began to shrink and fall away. See what you have done, she screamed. In a minute I shall melt away. I'm very sorry indeed, said Dorothy, who was truly frightened to see the witch actually melting away like brown sugar before her very eyes. Didn't you know water would be the end of me? asked the witch in a wailing, despairing voice. Of course not, answered Dorothy. How should I? Well, in a few minutes I shall be all melted, and you will have the castle to yourself. I have been wicked in my day, but I never thought a little girl like you would ever be able to melt me and end my wicked deeds. Look out! Here I go! With these words the witch fell down in a brown, melted, shapeless mass and began to spread over the clean boards of the kitchen floor. Seeing that she had really melted away to nothing, Dorothy drew another bucket of water and threw it over the mess. She then swept it all out the door. After picking out the silver shoe, which was all that was left of the old woman, she cleaned and dried it with a cloth and put it on her foot again. 
Then, being at last free to do as she chose, she ran out to the courtyard to tell the lion that the wicked witch of the West had come to an end and that they were no longer prisoners in a strange land.